Hello everyone, my name is Pixelrifts and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to start by crafting a spyglass. For that, we will need to come down to the basement, open our precious materials, and grab two pieces of copper and one amethyst shard. We'll simply put those in a line in the crafting table and we'll get a spyglass, which, when you hold down right click, will allow us to see stuff a little further away. I also crafted myself a new bed. We're going to pick a cornflower from outside so we can get blue dye and turn this one blue because this is going to be the seabed. And for that purpose, I'm going to make sure I have a boat on me. But today we're going to make our boat out of bamboo planks because the bamboo boat actually looks like a raft. And by adding a chest to it, we can have a bamboo raft with chest. And we're going to go out in search of shipwrecks. This is going to be the first video in what I'm thinking of as structures week, where we go out and find structures that generate naturally as part of your Minecraft world. And while you can find them at any point, it's often very beneficial to know where these are in the early stages of your world. And already over here, I'm finding my first shipwreck. Let's take a quick look at the coordinates here. We are at negative 530. 300. You'll find shipwrecks like this made out of different wood types in kind of different orientations. Some of them may be flipped upside down, some of them may be on their sides, some of them may have sections broken off of them like this one, but each one is guaranteed to contain at least one treasure chest with a possibility of up to three. In this case it looks like the only chest is actually down here in this watery section, so let's see if we can reach that, and we have immediately struck what we are looking for. I mean, first of all, we have some carrots in here, so if we didn't get one of those to drop from a zombie, we'd have a chance of growing and farming carrots after finding a shipwreck. Likewise, moss blocks can sometimes be found in these loot chests, just in case you haven't found a lush cave yet. There's a little bit of leather armor, including some leather boots that have mending, which would be perfect for traversing mountains. And there's a little bit of rotten flesh and suspicious stew, which are both kind of dubious food sources. The main prize, though, is right here. This is a smithing template, which are new to Minecraft 1.20. This coast armor trim template can be found in shipwrecks now, and the purpose of this is to add cosmetic designs to your armor, allowing you to customize any piece of armor from leather all the way through to netherite with a variety of different designs. Each of the designs can be found out there in a generated structure somewhere in your Minecraft world, and some of the structures even have multiple designs. So while you'll find this coast design in shipwrecks, you'll find different ones in jungle temples and desert temples, and even some of the structures in the nether. Part of my goal with this structures week is to head out and find some of those as well, so we can explore some of this new content that is arriving with Minecraft 1.20. So it looks like that is the only loot chest we are getting in this shipwreck, and if I dive in and take a look around, you'll also notice I'm moving a little bit less sluggishly, I'm moving faster underwater, thanks to the depth strider effect that I added to my boots a couple of episodes ago. But for now, we can load some of this shipwreck loot into the chest on our raft, and we'll head back over towards our spawn point, because I happened to notice there was a shipwreck over there last time I was visiting. Here we go, there is another shipwreck right here, and it looks like it is actually in roughly the same sort of shape as the other one was. The materials are slightly different, but it seems like the back half here has sort of been broken out. There is still a little air pocket here where the door is, so if you need to dive down to one of these, you can always rest in the door if you're playing Java Edition. Unfortunately, in Bedrock Edition, this won't be the case since doors can be completely waterlogged, so bear that in mind if you're exploring these wrecks. It looks like this time around we got some coal, we got a bit more moss, some leather pants with Cursor Vanishing, some bamboo, and some more suspicious stew, but we didn't get any additional treasure, and you'll notice we didn't get any armor trim that time. So those smithing templates have a small chance to occur in shipwrecks, but will not be there every single time. So it's worth keeping hold of these to see if we can craft some of our own a little bit later. Having slept for the night, I'm going to return to my boat, and let's see if we can find a more intact example of a shipwreck. Well, as luck would have it, from the first shipwreck we raided, I can actually see a second one over here. This seems to be the shipwreck district of our world. It seems to have quite a few of them. And this one, while it is completely submerged, looks like it has more of the vessel intact. So hopefully we should be able to find all three of the potential treasure chests we could find. Although, from the surface here, it looks like we may have to do a bit of digging. Some of this wreck has been submerged by the land, and bits of sand are creeping in here. So, we're going to dive down very quickly, look for this back cabin here, and open up this chest, where we can find some valuables. We've got a bit of iron, some emeralds, and some lapis. Occasionally, you will find some gold and diamonds in those chests, along with the possibility of getting some more armor trim smithing templates. So, it's worth raiding 
those chests, especially if you're starting out your world, you've noticed a shipwreck nearby and you're in need of some easy iron. Of course, bear in mind that your oxygen meter is going to run out, so it's probably worth coming back with some more effective tools and even digging down, if you can, to find where this door has been submerged. Because the door in shipwreck structures often leads through to this cabin, which right now is filled up with blocks and a little bit of water. But if we use our water bucket a couple of times, we might actually be able to remove some of the water from this flooded cabin. I can place a torch in and we can open up this chest because this contains some really interesting stuff. First of all, we have a clock, which we can grab. We can make those ourselves with gold and redstone. And I don't always find them the most useful accessories in Minecraft, but if you're in a cave, it can be be a good idea to keep one on you and tell whether it's night or day on the surface. There is a little paper and a book in here, just an empty, unenchanted book, but this is really what we are here for. This is a map that will point us to some buried treasure somewhere nearby. Scrolling over to the map, we can see that there is a red X marked on it, as well as a dot in the upper left-hand corner, and that dot signifies where we are in relation to this map. So right now, we are off the northwestern corner of this map, so it stands to reason if we go southeast and follow the coastline a little bit, we should hopefully run into the place where this treasure is buried. I'm also going to dive back down to take a quick look at this chest in the front, because because that has come through with two more armor trim templates for us. That's absolutely spectacular. We also got some TNT, a little bit more bamboo, and two more suspicious stews. So all of that is now going in the raft. We have four coast armor trims. We have a bunch of loot from that chest in the front. We'll throw the bamboo, the stew, and the TNT as well. But the map we want to keep on us, and if I'm holding something in my offhand, you'll notice that the map appears in my main hand. But if I take my shield off like so, the map will appear much larger in front of you and you can actually look down to see a larger view of it. So let's get into the boat here. Let's assess the angle of the sun. The sun is setting right now and that means that is west, which means that if we want to travel southeast, we should head in this direction. As you can see, as I row in this direction, our marker on the map has actually moved. We are coming in towards the middle of the map here, which indicates that we are almost far enough east, and now we just need to head a little further south. Along the way, we are passing an ocean monument, which I'll just zoom in using my spyglass for a second here. These are large structures you will notice under the surface of the water in deeper ocean biomes, and you'll often find that they are surrounded by creatures called guardians. I'll get a little closer to see if a couple of them spawn. There's one right now, these fishy creatures with one central eye. I recommend staying away from these for now since they present a challenge which is going to be slightly easier for us once we are potion brewing and can brew potions of water breathing that will allow us to stay underwater for longer. Rowing over the top of them is also not advised since these guardians will actually shoot you with laser beams from that central eye and if you go close enough to the structure, the face of an elder guardian will appear on the screen and give you an effect called mining fatigue, but for the moment I think those are best avoided. Now we come close to the shoreline here and if I take a look at my map you can see that we've now uncovered an area of the map so it is much clearer exactly what spot we are aiming for. The X marks the spot around here and it looks like if we row a little further this way, roughly here should be the area where we find our treasure. I'm going to leave the boat for now, we're going to swim on down because it looks like this goes a little deeper than I would like for a treasure diving expedition. So I'm going to make sure I'm up here on the surface and I'm going to position my player marker so that the tip of the arrow is just coming out of the bottom of the X shape right there. We're going to swim down, and I'm going to grab my most efficient shovel and I'm going to try and dig around this little patch of gravel hoping that we will find what we want. Although looking at it, most of this gravel only goes one block deep and then there's a layer of stone, and you will typically find these buried treasures underneath gravel or sand, so it's definitely worth digging around in the sand layers here. And there we go, we found our treasure chest. Let's open that up, quickly grab everything in here, and return to the surface where we can discuss what it is we've just found. So we got some iron and gold right there, there's a little bit of cooked fish, we got some salmon and some cod from that chest, which can be really good if you're low on food a little bit of TNT, and a potion of water breathing that will last for three minutes. These water breathing potions can be really useful to find if you intend to continue diving for shipwrecks, so it's worth having one of those on you, and you'll often get one or two of them from those buried treasure chests. The main prize here, though, is this Heart of the Sea, which cannot be found in any other loot chests at this point. It is unique 
to buried treasure chests. For now, exactly what the Heart of the Sea is used for is going to elude us because there are a couple of other resources we need to acquire before we can use that to its fullest effect. But if you've been getting hold of any Nautilus shells when you've been out fishing, keep hold of those because they can be crafted along with the Heart of the Sea to make a very special block. For now, if we want to, we can continue exploring the area here on the map. You'll notice that when my player marker is on here, you actually get an idea of the direction that I'm facing. And as we walk around here, the remaining blank space on the map fills in with the surrounding environment. If I swap the map to my offhand here and I place a few blocks, then I can walk away a little bit. You'll notice that there is now a red dot on this map. That appears where we placed those four blocks of TNT, and these maps will update live. If you're holding one in your hand and you place blocks or you modify your surroundings in any way, those changes will show up on the map. But in terms of guiding us to that buried treasure, this map has done all it can. So we're going to head home, unpack some of this loot, and if you stick around for the rest of the video, we'll apply some of this armor trim to our armor for the first time, and we'll also take a look at crafting your own maps in case you want to make maps of other areas in your world. Hey folks, welcome back. So back on shore, we have left our chest raft floating down there. I've thrown out a couple of the things that are less useful to me, like a couple of blocks and rotten flesh, because we are really here for all of the treasure that we've acquired. The precious materials we're a bit more familiar with right now, so we can sort those into here. We've got emeralds for the first time, which is actually pretty exciting. We can keep hold of those, and if the wandering trader happens to stop by at any point, we can trade with him for the first time. I'm going to hop down to the cow farm, kill one cow, so that hopefully we grab a little leather. Yep, there we go. And we're going to make an item frame to put this map up on the wall. In a previous episode, we already covered using item frames to place items in so that you can label your chests and your storage, but they can also hold maps and they will display the explored area of a map. Naturally, the map feels kind of incomplete with all of the land cutting off at the corners, but if you took a map of the adjacent area, if you were standing off this map to the east, let's say, and you opened another map that you had created yourself, you would be able to put these two maps together and they would form a coherent picture of the landscape. I think for now we'll put this one on the wall in the basement, maybe right here, since we don't expect to be revisiting that spot anytime soon. But if you want to craft your own map of the area, which we're going to do for the house right now, we will need to start by making a compass. For that, you'll need four iron ingots and one redstone. That'll get you a compass, and then we'll need to get some paper. So eight pieces of paper surrounding a compass will get you an empty map. And if you right-click while holding this map, it will create a picture of your surroundings. It looks like all we need to do is go down here to fill in the corners to the southeast and southwest. And our house is clearly marked on here, although it does go off the north part of the map. Minecraft's maps are actually locked to a grid, so it isn't necessarily going to open centered on the location where you first use the map. It's going to take a top-down picture of a region of your Minecraft world, and if you cross the boundary of this map into the next door region, you can open another map there, and you'll be guaranteed to have two maps that line up correctly when you put them together in an item frame. I'm going to quickly craft up another map to show you this example. If I walk north from here towards my nether portal, I actually cross over the northern boundary of the map that we first made, the one that contains most of our house, but not all of it. You'll notice that the roof ridge is actually too far north to be featured on this map. So once our player marker becomes round and you can't see which direction you're facing, you are guaranteed that you are off the edge of that map. And in this case, we should be onto the next one. If I open this map now, there we go. You see the top edge of our house and the surrounding terrain has all filled in. You can even see the little black line just below my crosshair there where we have created our nether portal. And that also hints in the top right corner with those red blocks that there is some lava somewhere down there, perhaps in a ravine. So maps can be quite an interesting way of getting a bird's eye view of your Minecraft world and spotting things that you might not have spotted otherwise. But we're going to put those two in item frames. We're going to put that one that we just made at the top here and we're going to put our original map in there. And as you can see, that now creates a complete picture of our starter house there in the center. It's even updated to include those acacia trees that have grown outside. So watch what happens when we take down these acacia trees and let the leaves decay or break them manually just to remove them from the map. Now when you look out the window, you can see I've taken down the acacia trees. We just have a couple of leaf blocks still decaying, but the map here still shows a top-down view of those three trees. Because when a map is placed on the wall like this, it will not update live. It will only update if a player is holding the map. And as you can see now, 
those three trees have completely disappeared from the map. Now, if we want to keep a map like this permanently, let's say we are planning on making changes to this area, but we want to make sure we get a snapshot of what the map used to look like before we built a bunch of extra stuff, we can craft a cartography table using four planks and two paper. And this will allow us to do a couple of different things. First of all, if we put the map in here with an additional piece of paper, it will scale up the map. So where our first map was one to one scale, this is one to two scale. You'll notice that now the area we have explored is only a circle around here, and we have to travel a little bit further in order to reveal more of the map. And now, of course, the maps we had on the wall before are no longer to scale with this map. You will also notice that some of the map is still hidden, and therefore it doesn't show up in an item frame. It won't fill in those two corners until we've taken the map and gone and explored them. We can continue to scale up this map if we want to, and now our starter house is barely even visible behind our player marker dots, but if we walk over this way, we'll start to see the mountain rendering in as well. At this point, the map is going to show you a much more overall view of this area instead of showing some of the fine detail. Like genuinely, that little blob of grey and green towards the bottom half <laughs> that my player marker is now pointing at, that's our house. And believe it or not, this map can be scaled up twice more. As you can see right now, this is saying level 2 of 4 at 1 to 4 scale, level 3 of 4 at 1 to 8 scale. 1 to 16 scale maps are possible, but we're not going to go that far because at that point our starter house is going to look very insignificant. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to grab 6 glass. We'll convert those into glass panes in the crafting table, kind of in the same formation that you make walls, and I will show you that if you put a map in the cartography table with a glass pane, it becomes a locked map, and this will lock the content of the map, which means anything that you change after that will not show up on the map even if you're holding it in your hand and exploring that area, which can be useful for a couple of reasons. Perhaps you want to keep a record of the area around you before you start making any changes to it what the area used to look like before you develop it into a village or a town or a city or create a bunch of farms here or whatever. The other option is to do the opposite. Maybe you write a bunch of messages on the map. You lock the map in a cartography table, and when you remove the messages, the map will still display everything you wrote on there. With a range of different block colors that can show up on a map, it is possible to create map art, which you can then take down in the overworld but still have displayed on a locked map in your hand or in an item frame. So with that taken care of, we can focus on the next item on our list using this armor trim. We're going to create a smithing table using four planks and two iron ingots. That's going to go down over here. And for those of you who've seen the smithing table in previous updates, it has undergone a change for Minecraft 1.20. In this case, there are now three slots here, the first of which prompts you to add a smithing template. So we're going to add the coast armor trim here, and then these two slots will appear to tell you to add a piece of armor and add an ingot or a crystal. So we're going to pop down to the basement to see what we have here. And for now, I think I'll grab one of everything I've got in here. So we've got diamonds, we've got redstone, amethyst, and we've even got emerald now. So we can take a look at all of these in the smithing table. We'll pop the coast armor trim in there, and let's put our helmet in here along with an iron ingot. And as you can see here, that adds a band of material around the outside of the helmet just here. It might be a little bit clearer if we use a material other than iron. Let's try emerald. There you go, you can see that green band around the top there. We can put copper in there, and the color of that is obviously dictated by the material we put in here, but the pattern is dictated by this coast armor trim. We could even add a subtle pattern to it by adding a diamond in here on top of a diamond helmet. That would still be visible. Quite expensive, but still visible. Redstone is another one that will stand out really strong. Let's see if amethyst looks good. Amethyst has a nice kind of purple pattern to it as well. And this obviously doesn't just apply to the helmet. We can take the helmet out of here and put the chest plate in, and you'll notice that the pattern is obviously a little different. We've got little cuffs around the sleeves here, we've got a central pattern in there, so it doesn't apply exactly the same pattern to everything, but the patterns are all kind of thematic, right? So the same thing goes for here, we have this blue trim around the cuffs of the boots, and with leggings we get a couple of stripes added in there as well. Now the thing to note about these is that once you have used the armor trim, it is consumed. We get the advancement crafting a new look, and the helmet that we enjoy Enchanted with Unbreaking 3 and Protection 4 is now upgraded with armor trim. You can see the back right here, you can just about see the sides as I turn, it's just a single band of material, but from the front it's got that dip in the center there. And that looks kind of cool, although a little out of place when I'm not wearing the rest of my armor. But as I said, the coast armor trim 
item was consumed by that process. So naturally, with these being items that you have to go out and find in shipwrecks, there are going to be a limited supply of them, and it's important to know how to reproduce them. To reproduce any armor trim, we need some diamonds, we need a smithing template for the armor trim, and we need a block of material that resembles the material the armor trim itself is made out of. So I believe for this coast armor trim, it's looking like a piece of cobblestone is going to fit the bill, and you'll notice the crafting recipe pops up in here. We need to put the smithing template there, we need to put the piece of material there, and we need to put seven diamonds around the outside, and you'll notice that pops up as two items in here, meaning that this smithing template just gets duplicated. So to those of you who've only found a few diamonds in your world, that might seem quite expensive for just a cosmetic upgrade to your armor, but in future, we'll look at ways of getting hold of diamond equipment without the need to even mine for diamonds. It's certainly possible to get those in other ways. And aside from that, diamonds only really have two other crafting uses, which are the enchantment table and the jukebox block. So once you've got a steady supply of diamond tools and armor rolling in from trading with villagers, the only other real thing you can do with them is turn them all into diamond blocks and hoard them. But now we have the opportunity to reproduce armor trims, which makes diamonds a little bit more valuable again. And even though my armor is looking a little bit ragtag right now. I have a variety of different pieces. I think it's going to be worth trying out a few of these different armor trim textures. So we'll throw that one on there. Maybe we'll add some diamond trim to these gold leggings. That's going to look kind of interesting. And last of all, I think we'll add some iron trim to my diamond boots, leaving us with one smithing template so we can always duplicate that again if we want to. <laughs> there we go. Since we've used the same armor trim, they all kind of share a pattern. They're all kind of dipping down in the middle and the different materials obviously look a bit of a mess right now. But until we get a full set of one type of armor and a few more armor trims, we've got limited options when it comes to customization. I'm also keeping a piece of gold armor on me because we're visiting the nether regularly, so it's worth doing. But here we are with a full set of trimmed armor. I'm going to put that smithing template here in one of my precious materials chests, and we can always duplicate that when we've got a few more diamonds to spare. But before we wrap up today's episode, we have a couple more things to take care of from our shipwreck adventure. The first First is the use for the Heart of the Sea. If we put that in the crafting table surrounded by Nautilus shells, we get this block called a conduit. And the conduit won't do a whole lot right now, but we can place it down in the world and it does provide light. It's actually a light source. Kind of difficult to tell in here with all of the torches around and the daylight coming in through the windows, but these are effectively light source blocks. And when surrounded by a block called Prismarine, their true use becomes clear. But we are getting a little ahead of ourselves because that ocean monument out there is going to be our source of Prismarine. Marine, so we're going to have to wait until we can tackle that before we really see what the conduit is capable of. The penultimate thing here is Suspicious Stew, and bearing in mind that Suspicious Stew can have a variety of different effects, we're going to make sure we consume this in the comfort of our own home. Yep, that gave me the blindness effect, although it only gave me it for about five or six seconds and then it clears up again. The effects never last very long, but they can be a variety of things. Anything from just giving you a little bit of extra healing to being able to jump higher for a couple of seconds to blindness, poison, and even the wither effect. So that's something we want to avoid. <laughs> but there is, of course, one final thing we can do in this episode, and that's all because the wandering trader showed up while I was explaining some of this. And since we just got some emeralds from those shipwrecks, we can go over to the Wandering Trader and do our first trades. Now, he's kind of walking away from me right now, but as you'll see, he has a variety of things available to us. We could trade him for some pink dye. We could get some saplings if we haven't already found any of these trees out there in the world. He is selling blue ice, which is a rarer block than some of the others, which is why it's a little more expensive. But in this case, I could buy some glowstone from him. We're gathering that from the nether now, but I think it's worth doing a quick trade here. And we get the what a deal advancement for our first time trading with a villager because technically the Wandering Trader falls under the category of villagers, and we will be seeing a lot more of villagers in future episodes, but for now, it's nice to know that we can do some trading closer to home. Well, that's about it for this episode. It's been an eclectic one, much like the armor trim I'm now wearing, but hopefully you folks have enjoyed this first look at going and raiding some of the generated structures that exist in the world, acquiring some interesting loot, and trimming your armor, plus all of the maps and stuff like that that we covered too. So thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixelriffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye for now.